three. We're calling this series, or part of this series, Contemplative Theology, colon, Recovering the Roots. What do we mean by theology? It comes from two Greek words, theos, which means God, and logos, which means the Word of God. Let me just go to the first uh, part of John, who's considered probably the great contemplative theologian of the early church, or the great mystical theologian of the early church. And he begins his prologue, within the beginning, or Greek word here is arche, which means at the ground of all things is the logos. Often logos is interpreted, translated to mean the rational principle which holds everything together, ultimate reality. But logos can be interpreted as the presencing of that which is present. And contemplative theology is about being present, it's the presencing of that which is present. Uh, let me return to this in a few minutes, but I want to tell a story first of all, and this will help um, unpack what is how theology has often been understood. Once upon a time there were flatlanders. The flatlanders thought all of reality was flat, rivers flowed around the flat areas where their houses were, they built up businesses around that. But a visitor once came to the flatlanders and he said, you know, there are great mountains in the distance you can't see from here. The mountains reach up to the blue canopy, there are glaciers on the mountains, there's water much richer uh, than the water that you get in your lowland streams. Come join with me and see these mountains. Some of the flatlanders didn't even think such things existed. Uh, others said, interesting, the world may be bigger than we're even aware of it. Now that level of knowledge, of course, of the mountains is what we call the lore of certainty. We are told by someone a reality doesn't exist. We have no experience of that reality, i.e. for the flatlanders, the mountains. And just as certain forms of theology can be about biblical exegesis, about what someone else wrote, um, biblical theology trying to bring together the big themes of the Bible, but what others have experienced, creeds about the nature of God, the nature of God's relationship to humans, the nature of the church, uh, confessional traditions. These are what we call the lore of other people's attempt to articulate and understand what reality is like. It's a bit like the flatlanders who've never been to the mountains, being told there are the mountains, but themselves never have seen those mountains. And so it's because of others' experience, others' writings, that in fact some leave the flatland and journey to the mountains. The second level of knowing, one is knowing through others, through others' writings, through others' experiences, and the way, say, in the Christian tradition, we've tried to make sense of that through creeds and councils and confessions and systematic theology and historic theology and biblical theology, but that's about the mountains. Now, those who left the flatland with the guide, over a period of time, they got closer to the mountains. And so this wasn't just information because of what someone else said, it was information uh, in terms of them actually seeing the mountains. So that then becomes a certainty of sight. We're aware of these things that they exist. We draw close to these realities. That's still not the same as actually climbing the mountains. That's a third level of reality, which we would call existential reality, experienced reality. And that's quite different from someone talking about mountains or with the eyes seeing the mountains. When one actually experiences the mountains, then a whole range of issues begin to emerge. Let me return again to John. In the beginning was the word. Now, what do we mean by word? It's the presence of that which ultimately is encountering us on our all too human journey. That raises a variety of issues and we think not about God, but we reflect on our encounters with God or directly we experience God. That takes place at three levels. Last presentation I gave, I talked about the Adam-Eve myth. Uh, when they uh, make decisions in which they indulge certain desires, they leave Eden and then God says, where are you on your journey? Now, we can flip that question around. We often have to ask God on our journey, where are you? 
And it is this encounter between humans and the divine, which is at the heart of reality, experiencing God, not just seeing the mountains, uh, not hearing about them, but actually being on the journey itself. That's living, uh, living theology in that sense. Let's unpack that in three areas. One is our personal journey in terms of our experience of God. Now, of course, within the Christian tradition, there are all these positive images of experience of God. God is shepherd, God is father, God is castle, God is supporter, God who is with us on the journey. That is one element of the more positive element of the faith journey in a personal way. The other side is what happens when people on their journey experience tragedy, suffering. People die very, very slowly. Uh, parents lose children. Uh, people live through famines. Uh, they live through war. Um, if we are talking about the relationship of God's being present to us, where and how is God present in the midst of such tragedies? Um, this is about theology. And we are often torn then between two aspects. One, the nearness of God, uh, in which we will get things like the Lord is my shepherd. And then other, for example, Psalms is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so when we think theology, we must often at the personal level deal with when we get, as it were, on the trail or the trek of life. There are going to be blue sky days. The trail seems clear. Everything is obvious. There are going to be stormy days. Uh, in which there are whiteout conditions, nimbus clouds come in, life can seem tragic and difficult. And the big question the individuals will ask in the midst of tragic experiences is where, in fact, is God? God seems absent. There seems to be the eclipse of God. People almost seem orphaned. And so this becomes a very important question for anyone grappling with uh, the presence of of that which is present in time as eminence and being with us on our journey. And how do we make sense of that in the midst of tragedy? And it's one thing to say Christ died on the cross for in the past, he knew what that was like, but what does that actually mean for us in the present existential sense? Uh, and this is, theology has to address these questions because when people live in very raw moments of their journey and God does not seem present, in fact, they often feel, feel alone, um, all the positive images often just collapse very, very quickly in the midst of dark places. The second element that we all must live with, certainly on the Christian journey, is our life in the church. Christ is the head, uh, the, body of church, uh, the body of Christ, the Corpus Christi is his body. You get these um, exquisite prayers by Christ in John 14 to 17, that we are to be one as Father, Son, and Spirit are united, are one, and as we are raised up in Christ, we are to have the closeness, the intimacy um, of Father, Son, and Spirit. But here we are faced with another dilemma when we do theology, once we move beyond just the personal and the individual into the corporate. Um, the prayer is for one, and yet where is the eminence, the closeness of nearness of Christ, when the church constantly fragments and splits over theological, personal, worship wars, exegetical issues? Where is the Christ who brings the unity that was prayed for? Where is the spirit in which we say we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church? Where is the power of the spirit to in fact bring us together? And so this would be a second element on the journey in the mountains, uh, when we're actually talking about the presence of God, not just knowledge about God or seeing the great story, but actually living into the middle of the existential journey a journey of faith. Um, the last area would be the public side. I mean, people don't have to reflect too deeply on the 20th century, the wars, the carnage, the famine, the earthquakes, illnesses, uh, the sheer want and destruction uh, of life. It reminds me in some ways of Shakespeare. Life is a, a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing, or what's all this sound and fury. Um, how do people process on the one hand, the ideal that God is present, God is eminent, just not transcendent, God is supposed to be in time and history, and yet the experienced reality of time and history is often tragic. People are often, let alone sad, sad deaths, many of them die, torture, um, 
drawn out periods uh, in, in, in which people uh, at war psychologically or physically pass through phases in which they seem absolutely deserted and orphaned. And so we don't want to slip into cliches, uh, which often happens, uh, or comforting words at times in which people are going through a tragic context and they seem to be often left alone uh, in this. And so between these these three levels then uh, of trying to make sense of theology just not as something we think about in terms there is a mountain there uh, someone has told us about it uh, we see in some ways that such a reality could exist god may be there but when we actually go on the existential practical lived reality we inevitably live in three spheres, the personal, the individual, the communal, the corporate, and the public areas. In each of those spheres, we get two messages constantly when we do theology, the God who is the shepherd, uh, the father, the supporter, the one who is with us on the journey. And yet, when we hit those tragic elements of life, where, where in fact is God? Jewish traditions obviously had to wrestle with in the Holocaust. In much of the Hebrew canon, you get the God who rescues them in the Exodus. You get Daniel coming out of the lion's den. Well, those are almost Walt Disney sort of stories that end well, but many people's experience, in fact, is not Red Seas opening up to them, is not being protected from lions in lion's dens of their journey in life. In fact, um, they often die slowly, tragically, and many stories can be told about that. In my years on staff with Amnesty, I can tell you many tales in terms of human rights violations of the best people who uh, died in some of the slowest and most painful ways, and those who did live, just the ongoing psychological implications. I'd like to just finish this thing with theology with um, Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury, one of his favorite books, and probably the best poetic work of theology of the 20th century is T.S. Eliot's The Four Quartets. And one of the quartets, um, as we grapple with these questions, for they're not easy to deal with, um, and of course, people who overemphasize the tragic can get into cynicism, God just isn't there, and we have to take, uh, take control of our own lives. And um, this can lead in a certain direction, and certain elements of, uh, it's understandable when you get certain agnostics or atheists move in that direction, because often much of history seems to be the absence of God. Um, and yet we are promised the presence of God. Um, let me finish with this from T.S. Eliot. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope. For hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love. For love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you're not ready for thought. It's interesting, T.S. Eliot and the Four Quartets, and a part of contemplative theology uh, is attempt to that stance in which we learn to abide, to wait, to attend, and to listen to the deeper truths as they existentially come through to us, often on the complicated and difficult trails of life that anyone who's in the thick of the journey of life, uh, life will face. The task of then learning to wait in terms of contemplative theology takes us much deeper than just talking about God, uh, uh, journeying to the institutions that embody God, but when we are actually on the existential journey of experiencing God, we inevitably, if, we are all, if we're going to be honest at all, we have to deal with these very hard and pressing issues. Where is the Logos? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Logos is about the presence of the Divine with us, but how do we discern the presence of that which is present in the midst of tragedy via the Spirit, when often absence seems to be more uh, appropriate than a joyful God is with me on the journey. Hallelujah.